point of the conversation is you've just got to have your eyes wide open as to what you're actually doing. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today's show, a code cracker. We're going to dig into supply and demand, what it actually means, and how you can benefit from understanding some logic around how supply and demand interfaces with the urban world. Does that sound riveting? I hope so. I tell you what, we never know how these podcasts go until we get to the end. It could be success, it could be failure. You're just going to have to stick it out. If it's your first time tuning in, make sure you play the show in double speed. I don't sound like a chipmunk. And all the podcasts I've done are lessons on real estate. So feel free to zip back in time and listen to some ideas on real estate investment through the entire Urban Property Investment Series. Hey, uh, let's crack on because there's a lot to discuss. And I tell you what, when it comes to the amount of demand in my street, it is beyond belief. There are so many people that want to live here and there's no houses to buy. So anyone who gets a house seems to knock them down. I've been living here 10 years and I reckon every year uh, a couple of houses get traded and they get knocked down straight away because there is no supply of modern functional homes in my street. My street's going through gentrification it can drive you absolutely bonkers. So I tell you what, I've got uh, noise-cancelling headphones or or earphones that I'm going to put on if the house down the street starts to erupt with jackhammers, which was happening this morning. So these are good signals, though. When people are going into your neighbourhood and spending millions of dollars to create real estate, you know you're in the right place. You know your area is in high demand. It's probably fair to say that uh, we are in an interesting marketplace when it comes to supply and demand. I want to dig into some of the layers and deep dive into this because at a surface level, it can be quite often misunderstood, uh, both supply and demand. And I want to deep dive into it today. Obviously, let's take a macro view of supply around Australia, a macro view on supply and demand. Obviously, all that means is let's take a almost like helicopter position on what is going on and what tends to go on in real estate. And of course, then do a deep dive into how to use some of that macro information in your favor. Obviously, markets have what is fundamentally known as aggregate demand. There's a size or scale of a marketplace and the aggregate demand is ultimately something which uh, is measured, right? And typical aggregate news in Australia is the entire entire worth of Australian real estate is close to $10 trillion. It is the most, uh, it is where most people's wealth is in Australia. So it's kind of highly protected by government and central banks. Um, To put that in context, the Australian stock exchange is closer to $3 trillion. Uh, Australia's superannuation, sort of closer to $3.5 trillion. So Australia's wealth is locked up in real estate. And you can imagine over, certainly over the last sort of 12 months, we've seen some pretty good levels of growth across the real estate marketplace. From an aggregate level, though, we know that Australia has this kind of population-based business plan where it wants to increase the size of its population base. And as we know from population economics, that is quite often driven with the idea that you bring more people here, you build more houses, more houses need more coffee shops, more gyms, more services, and you kind of fuel this idea around the services economy. As we know, 
Uh, the business plan is near on 40 million people by mid-century, 2050, 2051. These are Australian Bureau of Statistics stats that Australia is doing this. We want to bring as many people as we can in to grow this economy, to grow the population, to fund growth. If you like, we need more people, more skilled people generally create uh, better outcomes because the more skilled your economy is, the better your economy grows and innovates. And quite often you get uh, new immigrants coming to the country and if they're highly skilled, they can start new enterprises, new businesses, new startups, or even evolve into running publicly listed companies. And of course, uh, the idea of bringing high skill into your economy is a smart one because it creates more jobs. Bringing more uh, low skill into your economy is not such a smart idea because it kind of steals wage growth from the marketplace, if you like. Now, I just sort of Googled the population clock. Um, it's around 25 million people uh, pushing to 26. We're at 25 850 odd thousand people here in Australia. So we have a, a, a birth every one minute and 45 seconds. This is this is what's going on. A death every three minutes and 12 seconds. We have a new person uh, arriving to live in Australia every one minute and one second. And an Australian resident leaving every one minute and 14 seconds to go overseas, to live abroad, perhaps to, uh, you know, do a gap year or something like that. So the overall total population increases every two minutes and 20 seconds at the moment here in Australia. That's an incredible figure. That in itself is a massive aggregate demand bubble, which is created. Now, as you can imagine, that uh, person that is created every two minutes and 20 seconds does not bring a property with them. So a property has to be created. And if you look at the family formation stage of what a typical home looks like in Australia, it's kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, basically, um, you know, husband, wife or partner and, you know, one and a half child. So, if you do the maths on it, right, you know, you've got one person who needs a, a house uh, every, well, you've got one person being created every two minutes and 20 seconds. If there's, let's call it four people to a household, well, all of a sudden we need a new property in Australia every nine minutes. Every nine minutes we have to create a property. And of course, this can create a bit of a sausage factory when it comes to real estate being created. It can create opportunities as real estate is created. So from an aggregate size, the marketplace is huge. Across Australia, we literally go through periods of producing lots of stock and then periods of producing very, very little stock. Right now, uh, we are... In, on the verge of massive undersupply, particularly in the apartment market. Now, to give you an idea, back in sort of 2015, around 110,000 apartments were created. Today, uh, we are near on seeing maybe around 50,000 across the whole country. So you can see there is just a, a massive shortfall coming. And when we look into the data, we can see that supply is dropping away and really uh, the next sort of three years or so is pretty bleak when it comes to the production of real estate. Obviously, houses can be produced faster than apartment complexes. Apartment complexes allow for more people, more density. Um, but apartment complexes are very, very complicated to build. And as such, the building approvals and building starts has reached an incredible low point in Australia right now to the point where we're really walking into the next few years with a housing crisis on our hands. So supply factors are very 
uh, can be very macro. And, you know, people often talk to me about supply like it's a linear concept. And it's very much not, you know, if we were to say how many uh, apartments does, you know, Sydney need to reach 2051, uh, it needs something like 17,000 apartment complexes of which would be eight-storey buildings with 64 apartments in them. So you need a lot of stock to reach this milestone of reaching mid-century population targets. And stock or supply of stock is very much uh, linked to the demand side of the equation. And from an aggregate size We need to understand that if the population swells and there's not enough enough stock, obviously that imbalance can lead to price imbalances in the real estate marketplace. Conversely, if there's too much stock, the market can uh, go through a period of sustained low growth, right? So again, um, this is macro. We're talking macro. And so right now, when we look into the future, it's very bleak from a macro level, the amount of production of real estate being created. There's not a lot of stock being produced. Building costs are very high to produce stock. Um, We're seeing uh, a lack of trades being able to even construct the stock that could be made if the market would allow it to be be done. Then we're going to look at demand factors, right? Because from an market macro point of view, demand can be artificially uh, sped up and it can be artificially slowed down. And how that is done is quite often done through credit availability. In other words, the ease of borrowing money. Now, it's fair to say that we've run out of stock because the ease of borrowing money in recent years has been relatively simple. Money has been worthless in the bank and that has meant that most astute people have jumped into the asset marketplace to ride the inflation which uh, unfolds when money is put at its lowest level. So credit definitely drives demand. And credit results in an oversupply or undersupply. In other words, if there's and if borrowing money is very, very expensive, lots of stock stalls and sits on the market. So the supply of stock becomes quite heavy. And when I think about really the past major eras of oversupply, you're probably going back to 2006, 2007, a lot of stock on the market, but interest rates were, you know, closer to 8, 9 and 10% depending on who you were to borrow money at the time. And probably, you know, you could go back to sort of 2014, um, there was a bit of overseas investment into Australia, a lot of buildings were being created by overseas developers. Um, And a lot of that was done to allow for affordability of rent. So what the government can quite often do in Australia from a helicopter point of view is go, well, you know what, let's allow foreign capital into the market to artificially bring prices down because uh, foreign investors will put their money as a safe haven into Australia, really not even wanting a return and you often get this sort of concept which I've discussed before of ghost urbanism. You know, Docklands is really a ghost city of overseas investors or ghost suburb rather of overseas investors with lockups. They don't even rent the properties out but what the idea of it is to governments go, well, you know what, let's allow a precinct to be developed and be sold overseas to increase the levels of supply. So if they are rented, uh, it lowers the rental yield and makes it affordable for people. And of course, if they um, flood the market with the stock, then of course that 
in itself can quite often at a macro level slow down the marketplace. So demand factors are, are real, right? And they do link into the supply of stock into the marketplace. So credit availability, foreign investment um, availability. Right now, uh, foreign investors are taxed too much in Australia. So they don't really see safe havening money into Australia um, as a massive thing. There are other countries which are a little bit more pro-foreigners, throwing money into their economies. Mind you, with uh, what is going around on around the world in geopolitics, it wouldn't surprise me if we start to see some moves within the foreign investment space. Obviously, the price of credit is a big factor. What does money actually cost? And again, when money is cheap, uh, you see a high level of demand. When money is very, very expensive, 10%, you see low levels of demand. Where Australia will probably end up from a a cash rate point of view is no doubt by sort of 2024, 2025, back to that sort of 2.5% level. It's probably fair to say uh, the temporary deflation of the cash rate to deal with the coronavirus can't last forever. You can't run an economy on a temporary uh, wartime cash rate. So you have to lift it at some point. And I think where Australia will end up is a really nice level of credit where it's priced accordingly, not too expensive, not too cheap, not even uh, moderately or medium price credit. It still will be cheap money. I think you'll find that money by 2024 will be, you know, bought from the bank at sort of circa four, four and a half, maybe five percent. And of course, if you're yielding five, six, seven percent on your investment, you're still doing very, very well. But of course, uh, investors and home buyers are two different things. Investors get the benefit of the rental return, home buyers don't. So uh, the price of credit is a big part of this puzzle. And again, generally, the more it costs to borrow money, um, generally, the demand starts to slow a tad. Obviously, employment is also part of this puzzle. And I think it's you know fair to say right now, even if you bought at the peak of the market and lost your job, you could get another job tomorrow. Um, and you know, that's where we find ourselves today. So certainly from an employment point of view, no one's going to work and seeing their colleague at work get wiped out, uh, get retrenched or, or, or pushed out of their job. And this is a, a, a big psychological thing inside real estate. I know, for example, when I've seen certainly slowdowns in the economy, one of the first things to go is the employment market. And of course, when businesses are shredding jobs and getting rid of people, what that can look like to someone going to work, realizing that Wendy is no longer there, uh, who you just had lunch with yesterday, that can become a bit of a dent and definitely stop the psychology of the marketplace. So employment is obviously a thing. Obviously, here in Australia, we love the idea of population growth, the idea that uh, if we if we pour more people into the funnel, eventually they come through as buyers. So if you like here in Australia, from a macro level, we create demand through first home buyers and really new immigrants coming into the market who ultimately become first buyers themselves. The tax system is very pro property. And right now, uh, there's still obviously demand factors that push people into the uh, demand equation through the tax system, through the, the benefits of buying real estate, negative gearing and so forth. So these are kind of the demand factors which really do influence the psychology of the marketplace. And from a supply level, really, we can find ourselves in uh, in a place where we can either be oversupplied or undersupplied. But it's fair to say that if you think about it logically, 
credit has been so cheap that so many people have used that money to upgrade their life into real estate that it has obliterated the level of stock. So even though it feels like perhaps the price of money will eventually change going from its temporary rate to reinflate itself to a normal rate, uh, we are still in a very weak level when it comes to supply. And again, the sustainability of growth is quite often linked to the idea of supply. Now, affordability obviously plays a massive part when it comes to the idea of demand. And, you know, when you think about how demand works, a decrease in household income can uh, affect, obviously, the amount of people that want to go and and buy and upgrade a, a property. And when you think about the boom that has just unfolded, it's been an upgraders boom. Everyone's got access to cheap credit. They're going, well, you know what? I want a better home. And so I'll borrow more money to buy a better house or better apartment or better town home. And fundamentally, that has that has unfolded. And I guess moving forward, will demand still be high? I think it still will be very, very good because the price of money is not going to get out of control. Obviously, when it comes to the concerns on people's minds when it comes to demand is the future of the economy. I mean, does the economy look good? Is the economy actually growing? Is it dealing with any headwinds which have come its way. And uh, I would say that for the most part, we are sort of going into a place where really there are factors that drive the real estate marketplace, if you like. Interest rates will eventually go up. The economy, for the most part, seems pretty sound. Government is still very much about stimulating demand And demographically speaking, consumers are interested in the real estate economy. They see that if they can find value, they will take that and absorb it. So there is still overall very, very good demand. But as you can see, the pillars of supply and the pillars of demand do uh, buffer differently. Obviously, um, If you want to bulletproof your property investment, it's pretty simple, right? You want to own an asset where demand notionally always exceeds the supply volatility. And right now you've got a pretty much a free hit because of the aggregate supply being created into the market being very, very low. In other words, for the next three years, you're really not going to be impacted by a lot of stock coming along. But there are times where the market is overstocked. And that is why if you own an asset where the demand of that asset always exceeds the supply going on in the marketplace, then you're always going to do well. And I often have these conversations with property investors that sometimes they buy a property and then they're like, well, why is there more property being created in my suburb? And you're like, well, you bought in a suburb which is a very competitive neighborhood. Like you you went to a neighborhood which promotes supply. Um, and again, density and supply done right is a good thing for a neighborhood density and supply done wrong is a bad thing for a neighborhood. The point of the conversation is you've just got to have your eyes wide open as to what you're actually doing. And I'll give you some lessons around how to spot the different sub marketplaces so you can understand what you're doing as a property investor, because quite often property investors, I see it all the time, They jump into a suburb. They don't really know the future supply landscape of that suburb. They don't really know if what they're buying is unique to the market. And fundamentally, 
if it's an asset which will notionally exceed the supply chain coming through the system. You can't beat supply. Supply is always going to be coming to the Australian marketplace. You can't uh, buy a property and then supply never is created because Australia wants to create supply off the back of the fire economy. So the supply engine, if you like, is the idea that uh, we can monitor how fast supply gets uh, sold and how it gets absorbed, if you like. And some simple tips are things like you can monitor sales volumes, you can monitor the average property price, auction clearance rates, discount rates, average time on the market, development approvals for a suburb, typical approval lengths of a suburb, population growth of a neighborhood. Uh, All of these things allow you to understand, well, how fast is real estate actually absorbed in a neighborhood that I want to buy in? And if a neighborhood is what we would often refer to as fixed or variable, like how fixed are people buying in the suburb? How often do they sell? What is the average length of how they hold real estate? Now, every suburb in Australia has a turnover rate. The turnover rate on average of a neighborhood is around 5%. In other words, if you buy into a suburb and there's a thousand properties, 5% of that 1,000 properties will be sold uh, every single year. If you buy into a suburb and there's 20,000 properties, 5% of that 20,000 is going to be put up and resold every single year. Now, uh, if you go back 20 years the average turnover of a suburb was closer to 8%. So 20 years ago, 8% of the suburb would be uh, sold off and people would, you know, obviously go and buy something else. Today, it's closer to 5%, which is quite a staggering drop. Like when you measure that drop, that's almost like a 35% drop in turnover of stock coming to market. So what that tells us is Australians are actually holding on to their real estate longer and no doubt because of the price challenges with Australian real estate, people can't readily buy and, uh, well, sell and rebuy as much as they have done in the past. And of course, to borrow money can quite often be as equally challenging. Now, I own a lot of real estate um, and I couldn't afford to buy the property which uh, I'm doing this podcast from. Um, I own the property, but I couldn't afford to buy it on today's value. And so the the reluctancy of me letting go of the real estate um, is, is a difficult thing for me to fathom because I could never rebuy in the same market based on my wage. So what you're seeing in Australia, because you're seeing of the price volatility of extremes in Australian real estate, people are holding on to real estate much longer than ever before, which is obviously a good thing for the stability of real estate. Now, when we think about the supply cycle, we can actually think about uh, three different parts to this puzzle. There's the property cycle, the supply cycle, and the money cycle. Today, I want to focus really on the supply cycle. It obviously interfaces with the money cycle and the property cycle. But when you talk about real estate being created, there are, it, it, it is a very, very interesting thing because it's very much connected to the cost to create things. It's very much connected to CPI, the uh, cost of goods and services. And obviously, um, we now find ourselves in a period of time where the cost to buy things is expensive. The cost to create things is expensive. So from a supply point of view, right now, 
if you can get your hands on the right real estate, which exceeds the level of demand in the marketplace, it's critically important because you're going to get even more micro growth into the future. But what we are saying is uh, the ability to create affordable supply is virtually impossible at the moment in the marketplace. And as such, uh, not a lot of supply will be created. And again, from a macro point of view, This is quite encouraging for anyone who owns real estate or even anyone who is buying real estate. You've kind of got a bit of a free hit into the next couple of years. In other words, though the cost of money is probably likely to change, a tidal wave of stock coming to market to depress your real estate is not going to unfold, which is Uh, a great thing, obviously, for real estate investors. The other thing is because a tidal wave of stock is not coming to market, your rents are going to go up because there's not enough stock being created to compress the rental marketplace. And in the past, to compress the rental marketplace, what uh, has happened in the past is a lot of foreign investment has created foreign investment zones, foreign investment buildings, compressing the yield, if you like. And so uh, the yield uh, for a lot of real estate is about to rise or is already rising. I know I can personally vouch that my rents across Australia and all my assets have gone up. Now, again, if we go back to this kind of notion that uh, we would like to own real estate where demand notionally always exceeds the, uh, the level of stock being created, we can do that in a few ways in Australian real estate. Uh, one way to consider it is some suburbs have a variable amount of supply coming to market. Some suburbs are very fixed around the supply that comes to market. So I teach this by teaching there are five subclasses of locations when it comes to buying real estate. You can have uh, a marketplace which is led through transformation or gentrification. Uh, You can have a suburb which is led by competition, new stock being created. You can have a suburb which is very tightly held, very nimby. Uh, NIMBYs are basically people who say, you're not building that in my backyard. You can have what I refer to as marketplaces, which are oligolopies. In other words, the seller is always in charge. The buyer is never in charge. Uh, And I always teach an oligolopy as... Uh, in business terms, you know, Coles and Woolworths are oligolopies. Like if you want your food, there's really not many choices. And so some suburbs, some real estate, there's not a lot of choice. Like if you want it, you've got to pay the price to get it. Uh, I also teach the idea of aspirational marketplaces, marketplaces which uh, really people clamor to want to buy in And quite often they're found in more that sort of missing middle of Australian real estate. They're very fixed places. Not a lot of stock that is put into a NIMBY suburb, an aspirational middle ring suburb, or a suburb where the seller is always in charge, oligolopy marketplaces. So uh, over time, there is this kind of like sustained demand, which fundamentally always exceeds the supply of the market imbalances. Remember, the aggregate size of the market is what we're talking about here with like, you know, Australia's 25.85 million people. It wants to reach 40 million people. Needs another, what's that? 14 million people. Uh, That means it's going to need millions and millions of properties. And so... The, the cool thing, if we choose suburbs which are very NIMBY orientated, very middle ring orientated, uh, or very oligolopy orientated, where the seller is typically always in charge, I know that sounds 
counterintuitive that why would you pay more uh, of someone if the seller is always in charge? The seller is always driving a higher price. Uh, well, the short answer to that is once you're, you go through the process of buying, you become the seller. And if all your neighbors are always selling at a higher price, then uh, you fundamentally control the market landscape. And again, it's you become the oligarch of the market. And so obviously in these type of fixed suburbs, the level of supply that comes to them is very, very low. Very, very low. There is always supply coming through the system and every suburb generally has supply pushed into it. But there are certainly some fixed suburbs out in uh, the community. The suburb I'm in right now, never gets a new development application. Never, it, it basically is probably a perfect example of an oligopoly. The, the seller is always in charge because there is no new level of stock ever created in the suburb. Uh, I've lived here 10 years. There's never been one new property created. However, there are plenty of knockdown rebuilds because there is a lot of old stock, which is past its use by date. So the demand structure of the suburb, if you like, is driven around old versus new of the neighborhood uh, based on the rebuilds of the same infill stock. And again, um, if you like, you could call it urban rebirth. My suburb where I am right now is a very much an urban rebirth suburb. So obviously some suburbs get more density. And again, uh, quite often we would call these suburbs competition markets. Really the only point of difference of those suburbs is price. Uh, there is stock always being created in those suburbs. These are suburbs which are typically further away from the efficient infrastructure. Uh, they may be more dense suburbs. They may be suburbs further and further afield, uh, further out and fundamentally more distance from, distant from the city. As we know, Australia has promoted the idea of urban sprawl. You know, you go further and further afield, you buy a property and, uh, you know, you know that you're in a, what we would for refer to as a new money corridor, a new money market, a population corridor. Now, there is no right or wrong with this stuff, but obviously if you're buying in a new population corridor, you're going to not have to pay the premium to buy real estate, which is in an oligopoly marketplace. So uh, there are some benefits to going to competition marketplaces, but generally speaking, competition marketplaces have more stock coming to them. There's a lot of new supply competition. So you have to be quite shrewd if you're going to buy in those suburbs. And this is where the best property, the best location within the sub suburb, uh, the best land in the sub suburb make the most sense. And again, eventually those suburbs get built out. And again, the city goes further and further and further afield. Uh, Let's face it, you're, if you are buying in suburbs like that, you're already ahead of a massive population that we know is coming. And quite often you see this, you know, uh, you can go towards the edge of the city and you drive through suburbs, you don't realize they were actually new communities just 20, 25 years ago, right? And today the price arbitrage of those suburbs, which look a bit more established, is chalk and cheese. They they have grown up, they've gentrified, and now they're more and more expensive. So again, it's a little bit driven around your budget when it comes to avoiding supply. If you've got a lower budget, you're probably going to have to go in and battle the competition marketplace. So if you are going to battle the competition marketplace, you've got to have a bit of a checklist, which I teach people all the time. And again, it's about the best 
property, the best location, the best design property. You just want to out muscle the marketplace. So your property is always the first to rent. And if you are ever going to trade up, use that get started property investment, perhaps to buy a more significant property investment, you've got something which is pretty cool to the market, a better designed home, a better designed apartment, a better designed townhouse. So market demand is something I love studying. And when you think about market demand, it is quite often driven around what is affordable. And I think this is something which, you know, shouldn't get lost on property investors. Most Australians, when you think about most people and what they can borrow to buy when it comes to real estate, is something affordable and something a livable. Uh, most people cannot spend $2 million on a home. Most people can't spend $3 million on a home. So because most people can't do that, the large demand pool of people in society is looking for something for, you know, $750,000, right? Where are the suburbs which are highly affordable but very, very livable when it comes to this budget? And again, when you go to competition marketplaces, the golden rule of competition marketplaces is is to find something affordable but highly livable. Why? That actually equals the gap of demand, the demand gap. In other words, there's more demand than there is stock readily available in affordable yet highly livable suburbs. A big part of my day, if you like, is finding these places, finding places which are extremely affordable but very, very livable. There's a big difference between affordable and un, uh, affordable and unsafe. Affordable and livable is completely different to affordable and and falling down and creepy and unsafe and weird and 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 uh, you know the suburbs full of crime. That is completely different to affordable yet livable. So again, if you go back to just understanding there's suburbs with fixed supply, very NIMBY, aspirational suburbs, typically, you know, those middle ring areas, very hard for, for stock to be created in those neighbourhoods, very NIMBY, um, very quite often blue ribbon, blue chip neighbourhoods that are like that. Then you've got obviously more competitive marketplaces where the city is growing. The city planners go, let's grow the density of neighborhoods. And you either get that with outer edge land or you get that with supply corridors, even infill supply corridors. And again, the trick to it is to go, well, is this actually an affordable offering to the marketplace? And is there a high level of livability? Do, will people want to live in this neighbourhood over the long term? What does the 10, 20-year forecast of livability look like in this neighbourhood? Is the suburb getting better or is the suburb getting worse? Now, when we track demand, demand has some subgroups, if you like. And again, this is something which quite often I use to measure just how much demand is feeding at any one time, right? Now, think about the marketplace. And as we know, around 5% of the market is resold every year. And then we add a layer on top of that of new stock created. Right now, there's uh, basically 5% of the market reselling every year of existing established stock and there is really not much more stock being created. We've kind of run out of the ability to create more stock. So then we go to who are the shoppers? Who are the consumers, if you like, when it comes to real estate? And so I put them in different categories. We've touched on the first one already, foreign investors and institutions. These are big players in the real estate marketplace. They kind of come in when... Uh, the government allows them to, and they absorb a lot of real estate and produce a lot of real estate. Right now, um, the demand of them shopping, though, is is not as big 
as, for example, some of the other groups. Then you've got uh, downsizers. Downsizers are obviously people who own real estate. They're not looking to downgrade. They're looking to upgrade, but downsize. They've made money out of real estate. They've got a lot of cash. If they relinquish perhaps a bigger home and they'll go find a much tidier, smaller, uh, sleeker property, but still a very, very nice property, this marketplace is one to watch, the downsizer marketplace. I do personally, uh, the, the latest or one of the properties I'm finishing buying at the moment, I'm just building it, is uh, an amalgamation. It, I bought a one-bedroom apartment and a two-bedroom apartment, and I'm turning it into a uh, 150-square-meter three-bedroom apartment. Why I'm doing that is there is a huge marketplace for wealthy downsizers relinquishing their $2.5 million property and moving across into the, uh, you know, pimping three-bedroom apartment space. And again, um, that marketplace is all cash. They don't typically need to go and borrow money and um, hope their mortgage and uh, valuations work and all the fun stuff you have when you're trying to build wealth. These people have built wealth. And the built wealth demand pool is a massive pool. If you can trade into they have built wealth, they're typically spending more on real estate, which is cool. So when you think about the demand uh, for for those people, um, you know, you've got geographical locators, the CBD, the CBD fringe, inner suburbs, but they're probably not really going to outer suburbs or the fringe, if you like. Some will go regional and rural for that tree change experience. So again, when we look at the demographical or geographical locators, uh, we know the downsizer wants really that blue ribbon experience because they've got the money. Then we've got the upgraders. And the upgraders, if you like, are quite often trading up. They've bought maybe a property investment. They're selling the property investment or they bought a first home. They're reselling the first home and they're trading up and uh, they will uh, fundamentally uh, provide a lot of action in the real estate marketplace. And again, um, if we look at the most recent boom, it has been an upgraded boom. And again, when we look at the upgrader marketplace, they are tending to want inner suburbs, outer suburbs, or urban fringe suburbs or middle suburbs. Um, so they're a really wide net of audience because they are upgrading their lifestyle, if you like. First home buyers uh, typically go to the urban fringe to start a family if they're a family formed first home buyer, or they'll go to the inner suburbs if they come from a another uh, demographic, if you like. And investors tend to also, um, from a segmented point of view, be the final pillar of demand. And investors can kind of get spooked out of the market and then they can be quite robust in the market. They ebb and flow. Obviously, the more active all the groups are, downsizers, upgraders, first home buyers, investors, and foreign investors and institutions, the more of them shopping at once, the more the feeding, feeding frenzy that is unfolding. And, you know, obviously out of the recent sort of budget and recent parliamentary reports, everyone knows that, that you know, the governments want first home buyers buying because the more they can get into the market, the less of this kind of inequality have and have not conversation going on behind the scenes. So definitely um, when it comes to the stability of the market, you see the different groups quite often shop at different times when the market cools and slows down. Um, you can see a, a, a different um, level of activity. But when we think through this logically, right, um, 
interest rates may move, the cost of money may move. Downsizers aren't going to be infected by that. Like they're all cash. They're trading down out of their asset, trading into a better sized asset for them. They don't need uh, the the hiccups of, you know, whippersnippering every weekend. They want to have some fun. Upgraders, uh, again, to borrow more money and buy a better asset may slow down because the cost of money will, uh, again, be relative to that conversation. Investors, yields are going to climb. So the cost of money is generally offset by the fact that rents pay for the cost of money. Uh, so they should be fine. They should be in the marketplace. First home buyers obviously are being stimmied into the market by the government. So I think you will see a, probably a slowdown in the upgrader section of the market, but not so much a downsize of first homeowner or investor section of the market. And foreign investment is kind of the wild card in this conversation. So obviously there are some demand signals which often are pretty simple for most property investors to comprehend. Things like infrastructure, hospitals, university schools, these are signals that things are good in a neighbourhood. And again, good recreational facilities, coffee shops, Pilates studios, yoga studios. I mean, these are all the idea that private enterprise is creating opportunity for a suburb. And I often think a, a good way to analyze a neighborhood is the quality of its retail. If you go to a strip shop uh, within the local suburb and it's you know run down and everyone's going out of business in that strip shopping precinct, um, you can see that the local community just doesn't really have enough disposable income to even fund its own retail. Conversely, if you go into a retail uh, suburb or a suburb which has obviously a strip, all suburbs generally have it, um, and the the local retail shops are booming and, and really there's not much for lease and there's new shops moving in and new businesses opening, it's a great demand signal because what it is showing you is the strength of the community. The local community is spending money. Now, think about how money works, right? Like the more I spend, the more someone else earns. And as we know, with demand, a lot of the demand off the back of COVID has gone very much local. So the more I spend in my local suburb, the more someone else is making in my local suburb from a retail point of view, the healthier that suburb actually is. And retail is a great way to study the health of a suburb. The de- it is a massive demand signal. I guess when we think about the idea of demand, you know, we need to also understand that humans love social status. They love improving their social connections, their social well-being. They love the idea that if they move to a suburb and their kids meet um, other smart kids from uh, better social status, life improves. Real estate is very much uh, built around the idea of psychology of social status. There are better neighborhoods. Better neighborhoods equals better social status. You will be invited to uh you know, higher and better events. And so we shouldn't underestimate that demand for social status is a real thing. And so obviously suburbs which carry better signals around social status are generally also always in a high level of demand. One I guess more macro element of demand, which is interesting, is that Australians are becoming a rental society. In other words, home ownership is dropping and renting for life is increasing. And again, this plays into the situation of property investors. If you provide really good properties to rent, you're always 
fairly well going to have a timetable of more real more renters coming your way. And again, I think it's 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 obviously just the way it's unfolding because of the cost of living and you know what people are earning and the price of real estate. But one of the the great things here is we are not seeing the rental market decreasing and home ownership fundamentally chasing off the idea that there is going to be less renters to go around. In other words, the pie is getting bigger when it comes to the rental market, not decreasing. And so from an aggregate level, as supply, new supply is created, as are new tenants being created to add to the level of overall stability of the marketplace. I guess when it comes to the idea around demand and supply as well, we can look at the conversation around spatial transformation, the idea that today people want to live, they want to be able to do everything, they want to live that 20-minute neighbourhood lifestyle uh, where they can live, work and play, they can uh, be part of uh, a great community. And obviously, when it comes to real estate investing, community matters. And so what we are seeing when it comes to the idea around demand in real estate is spatial transformation, is the idea that more people want to fit into lifestyle precincts than ever before. And there fundamentally isn't enough of them to go around. And of course, uh, what that is doing is again, and will continue to do, is put price pressures on quality-based suburbs. So demand uh, certainly is always transforming. And I think off the back of COVID, transformation to livable suburbs has been second to none. I think what we are also seeing is the idea that demand is also changing by way of uh, generation, right? And when you think about the different generations that are still alive today, you've got the builders who kind of built this whole thing uh, dating back to before World War II. There's, you know, few of them kicking around. Uh, their notion of what to live in is completely different to perhaps someone coming through the system now like a Gen Z. Uh, boomers, again, their notion of what they want in a home is completely different to a Gen X or a Gen Y or a, or a Gen Z. And when you study what is important to a baby boomer, it's uh, finances, it's uh, environmental impacts, but their first choice would be finances. If you look at a Gen X, it's environmental impact. Uh, it's not finances. If you look at a Gen Z, it's environmental and social impact. So again, the social transformation, people uh, coming through the system want a better community. And so they will pay more for a better community, whereas potentially some older people um, really aren't necessarily uh, worried about that from a social point of view. And of course, what many people will want is, again, a new level of demand, which does affect real estate investment. You know, one of the biggest problems with real estate is operational costs. Uh, the idea of improving real estate, making it relevant to the consumer, the demand of tomorrow. Uh, as we know, in the United Kingdom, they've uh, got rid of basically petrol cars, diesel cars by 2030. All cars will be electric. All homes will need to provide electric car stations. So what that does to the real estate market, it changes how people perceive future demand in that country. And it certainly is changing it here in Australia as we go through, uh, you know, obviously the climate transformation, which is unfolding. And, you know, you're almost seeing that Southeast Queensland's got a wet and dry season now. That never happened before. It used to have four seasons. Um, and, 
again, a lot of this comes back to how the perception of demand is coming through uh, the geopolitical system, right? So again, we're being taught to care about this stuff and certainly the younger people, certainly I get to hang out with them because I work with many of them, absolutely care about this stuff. And sometimes demand and supply and is misunderstood. So quite often you'll sort of maybe take a supply and demand view based on stock being created, but not all stock is created equally. And so again, you can have, say, 100 new properties come to market on the same day, but only a small percentage, maybe 5% of those properties are what we would refer to as high flight to quality. They are interesting to the market. Their architecture is interesting. They stand above the crowd. And again, I always teach my property investors, this is the stuff you're going to buy because you've got a budget, you've got uh, budgetary constraints. Don't buy the stuff which is homogenous by the interesting real estate if you're buying into the supply chain. And again, uh, sometimes when we think about the idea of oversupply and undersupply, we can take a different lens and think about it from a different behavioral point of view. Now, uh, one of my recent acquisitions a couple of years ago, I bought a property which I would refer to as very undersupplied because it is one of the very few properties which you can leave your home and walk and live a life without a car. It is what I would refer to as a walkable piece of real estate. Now, think about the cities that we have around Australia. How many properties could you live a life on foot on and own? N not many, right? And when we study urbanism, there are 1% of all suburbs in Australia that are fundamentally walkable. You do not need a car to live there. And again, uh, this in itself is an interesting way to study real estate. Uh, how valuable will a walkable suburb where you do not to be need to be part of the public transport system and or the congestion of the road system be in 20 years from now. If today Melbourne has 5 million people, but in 2050 it has closer to 9 million people, how valuable is a suburb where you don't need a car? Again, the idea around sometimes being a contrarian when it comes to the idea of how supply and demand works is brilliant. Now, in that suburb which I bought real estate in, which is highly walkable, there is more stock coming to that suburb, no doubt, because it is highly walkable. But what uh, will always remain in that precinct which I bought in, you can't strip away the ability that it sits in 1% of all suburbs in Australia, which is walkable. The walk score that that property gets is close to 100 out of 100. So sometimes we analyze supply in different ways. And I like to look at it that there's around 1% of suburbs which are walkable. There's around 4% of suburbs which are fundamentally uh, what I would call basically uh, light transit suburbs. You get the tram, you can jump in an Uber, you know, you can live a life pretty quickly, right? You can jet set around all the cool cultural places of the city within 15 minutes, an Uber ride or a tram ride or a quick ferry ride or one stop on the train. Like these are a last mile suburbs, last kilometer suburbs. And again, um, from a supply and demand metric, they're very undersupplied at an aggregate level. 
walkable suburbs, very undersupplied at, at an aggregate level. Think of all the stock being created, all the people coming to Australia over the next uh, next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. How valuable is a last kilometre or a last mile suburb or a walkable suburb? And then, of course, you've got drivable only suburbs. And again, 96%. 94 to 96% of Australia is drivable. You you can only get there in a car, right? And again, uh, certainly there are some great places which you can only get to in a car. There are some, some quality pieces of real estate in that section of the marketplace. But again, the way you observe the idea of supply and demand um, sometimes needs a different lens. And uh, certainly... I've made a lot of money uh, since buying my walkable only property. Uh, How much have I made? I've made like close to $250,000 out of a pretty simple property which I bought, right? Um, And it's been a great deal. Why is it a great deal? Because it's walkable. People who live there don't need a car. They can live a life on foot. It's just another way to analyze the demand that comes through the marketplace. Properties evolved over time. I think, you know, one of the interesting things we'll see into the future is the modern downsizer. Um, You know, they don't want the worst house in the worst street. They don't want that stuff. The modern downsizer, they want a beautiful property which they can lock up and go on a cruise ship. Uh, You've got the upgraders. Again, that marketplace is always looking for properties which they can add value to, renovate, knock down, rebuild, or just transfer to a bigger and better place. Um, And again, upgraders, even though that marketplace may slow down off the back of potential rate changes, they're not necessarily headed to the boonies. They're trying to upgrade their lifestyle, upgrade their social status if you like, which is uh, which is what this is all about. And I think, uh, you know, when we think about how demand really works, there's a fixed and finite amount of real estate which is designed perfectly. It's the right floor plan. It's the right architecture. It's almost um, – the right genre of real estate. If you think of what has been produced over the years, the Federation homes, the the beautiful real estate that is architecturally significant to the marketplace, whether it's modern or whether it's old, uh, there, there's just less of it. And so a big part of my day, if you like, I'm constantly working with star architects to understand what they're working on because I want the architecture which people will look back in 20 years from now and go, that is a beautiful home or that is a beautiful building. And again, the storage of wealth inside of things which are scarcer just has more demand. And so uh, it's a great way to consider looking at the real estate marketplace. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed today's show. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. And I'll catch you next time as we chat more real estate. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. And I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.